that tonight. Okay, so 7 p.m. Thank you everybody for tuning in. I'm Holly Kelson. I'm the program manager for Homewood Science Center. And tonight I am joined by Ryan Fuller at University of Chicago and Patty Messersmith, who is on our board for Homewood Science Center and is also a senior educator at Museum of Science and Industry. This is our Spotlight On series. This is a monthly webinar series that we're hosting in conjunction with our Citizen Science All About Birds program. Um, and so tonight we're gonna learn all about what is Citizen Science and then we'll introduce our bird of the month, the barn owl. Keep in mind that this session is recorded. You'll be able to find this session on our social media, on our website, and um, we'll email it out to all of our attendees tonight as well. So let's move forward. Um, I do have to remind you about your civic duty, not only to vote, which we know uh, there's some debates coming up, we promise to be done by the debates tonight, but also to complete your census. Um, the census, they have extended the deadline. So if you know somebody who hasn't completed theirs yet, please make sure that they get their census completed so that way everyone, especially everybody in Illinois can get counted in the 2020 census. Homewood Science Center has some very exciting news to share. Um, we are in the top 100 for choices for the 19th annual Chicago Innovation Awards. So Chicago Innovation, um, you can go to their website down here. You can find that in our agenda as well. All of the links that we're sharing tonight are found in our agenda, which you can find right in your control panel, your GoTo webinar control panel under handouts. Um, you'll have to go through the majority of this uh, voting because there's several different categories like business or um, food, and you can find out all sorts of innovative uh, products and businesses. And um, we're just really excited because we were nominated to be in the nonprofit category and we made the top 100. So, we made the top 100. so that way we can uh, be a People's Choice Award winner for the 19th Annual Chicago Innovation Awards. Okay, um, if you are just tuning in, please make sure you put yourself on mute. Um, we have some handouts and you can send your questions to us through the questions option. Um, so I wanted to share a couple other things that are going on with our citizen science program. So we have the lovely Liz Smith from Serendipity Yoga who will be exploring citizen science topics through our virtual family yoga. That will happen once a month on Saturday. So the whole idea is that we can learn about bird migration or we can learn about different types of birds across the world and um, we can learn about it all through movement and through breath and using our bodies as well. So that's really fun for those much younger learners. You can also pick up your pop-up science at home kits, which will be citizen science themed with many resources from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. The next pickup is October 24th from 10, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we're very fortunate to have the generosity of Walmart sponsoring our Citizen Science All About Birds program. Um, if you haven't heard, we have a Bird of the Month community journal. You go to homewoodsciencecenter.org slash citizen science, submit an entry about our Bird of the Month, which for October is the Barn Owl, which Ryan here from University of Chicago will be telling us all sorts of fun facts about barn owls. And Ryan, didn't you put an entry in our community journal too? Let's see, I think we have, uh... oh, there we go. Let's unmute Ryan here. Ryan, you put an, an entry in for our community journal, right? I did, yeah, I had a lot of fun exploring your, the links to eBird and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and just kind of went into a deep dive on barn owls. So I learned a lot that I didn't know previously. <laughs> so that was cool. fun. Well, that's great. And so um, the bird of the month, you can enter in your own submissions 
for the bird of the month and we're gonna give away cool prizes, but it's also a great practice for our students, our adults, anybody can submit an entry in our community journal. It's a great way to practice um, observation skills. And so tonight we have, oh, one last announcement. Don't forget to save the date, October 18th for our walk. Walton, this year is gonna be a little bit different. We will not uh, be able to have our big, huge fest that everybody knows and loves. However, we will be hosting a socially distanced nature walk and bio blitz. Um, so you'll be able to take part in a scientific study while you're here at the Isaac Homewood Isaac Walton Preserve. And this will be led by our conservation ecology interns. So you can register for that, find out more information at homewoodsciencecenter.org. So we have a lot of attendees joining us tonight. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I will um, have the honor now of introducing Ms. Patty Messer-Smith. Patty is a senior educator on a team of teacher professional development providers at the Museum of Science and Industry. And she's also on our board for Homewood Science Center. Patty works to model best practices in teaching science content and um, pedagogy that are reflected in the next generation science standards to third through eighth grade teachers in the Chicago area. Patty develops and writes science curricula for the professional development science courses taught at the museum. She has a bachelor's degree in environmental biology and developmental psychology from Luther College in Iowa. And after we hear from Patty about citizen science and what to, uh, how we can all become scientists, um, then we'll hear from Ryan Fuller. Ryan is a PhD candidate in the Committee on Evolutionary Biology at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on the flower plant genus Rhododendron, or you might better know it as azaleas, um, in Western China. Ryan is deeply interested in the natural world, often taking time to stop and observe the smallest things and soak in the oddest facts around, about the world around him. During his time in Chicago, he started bird watching nearly every day from the lakefront on the south side, the parks, the shores of Lake Michigan, really anywhere he travels. Ryan holds a master's degree from University of Northern Colorado, where he studied uh, the genetics of wildflower mountains across Colorado and Wyoming. Ryan spent time as a zookeeper at the Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium in Omaha, Nebraska. And he is waiting to answer all of your questions um, about the beautiful and natural world with, uh, that we share with others. So without further ado, Patty, if you wanna make sure that you're unmuted, I am going to go ahead and make you a presenter. Sounds great. And then while we're getting Patty settled in, I do have um, one poll that I wanted to just put out there real fast. And that poll question, all of our attendees can answer this poll. It's just to gauge um, what you know about citizen science. So let me launch this poll. So how familiar are you with citizen <laughs> science? Um, you've never heard of it before. You've heard of it, but haven't participated you've participated once, or you've done several citizen science projects. So you can go ahead and answer that poll question for us. Looks like about 60% of people have voted so far. And if you've already voted, make sure that you can go in and check out um, the different resources we have. Use your GoToWebinar control panel. You can ask a question you can find um, the handouts that we have. There's our Homewood Science Center flyer. We also have the agenda for the evening and we have a wonderful resource that Patty created with citizen science um, uh, resources for families. So I'm gonna close the poll. Let's see what people say. So some people have never heard about citizen science before. Some have heard of it, but haven't participated. 
We have a small group who have participated once, and we have a decent number of people, 29% have done citizen science. So Patty, we have a really mixed group of interests here. Okay, so there we go. Let's bring those slides back up, Patty, and you can take it away. Thank you so much, Holly, and welcome everybody. Excited to have you here um, talking about citizen science for families. We want to support curiosity, wonder, and excitement in science. As Holly mentioned, I'm an educator at the Museum of Science and Industry. I've been working there for 12 years. And um, what I do is I support teachers who are interested in um, uh, becoming um, more confident in teaching science. So we uh, support them and um, help them become excited about the idea of teaching science so that they are feeling more confident when they um, are in front of their students and enthusiastic about science. I'm also a board member at the Homewood Science Center where I develop um, programming and also teach. And that photo here is um, na the Native Garden in front of the Homewood Science Center. Uh, I worked with middle school students along with a couple of other instructors to inspire them to um, plant a native garden, which was a fantastic uh, project. So citizen science, what is citizen science? Uh, citizen science, briefly, it's a process by which everyone from uh, preschool uh, children all the way up to seniors can participate in the process of science, uh, joining um, scientific projects by being able to collect data for uh, different scientists and answer different science questions. Um, scientists are always um, looking to gather data uh, because the more data they have, the more confident they are in their research. And um, scientists need you to help them. Citizen science is not a new idea. It's been around for quite a while. One of the oldest citizen science projects is the Christmas bird count, which actually was started in the year 1900. Um, so there's so much data about birds that's been built over time by citizens just like you who have given scientists ideas of how many birds they see and which types of birds they see. And all of that data has been collected. Um, 64 million birds um, are counted about each year. And in the US alone, 60,000 people collected data for science last year. So there's no way that scientists could possibly gather that much data. And with something like the bird populations, um, having data all the way from 1900 has been extremely useful to scientists for many reasons. Most recently, um, looking at climate change, uh, because there's been changes in location, locations of where birds are migrating, um, as well as um, when they start migrating at different times of the year. So it's very important. Another great citizen science project um, that really helped scientists was um, discovering where the monarch butterfly, uh, where, where it goes when it migrates down south every fall. So this time of year, um, the monarchs all migrate, the Midwestern monarchs, um, up to 3,000 miles, which, was, which is amazing. And uh, scientists knew that they migrated, but they could not find where. And so citizen scientists began tagging monarch butterfly wings, like you see in this photo. Uh, and then as people collected uh, butterflies along the way, uh, along its migration, they would record the, the data from that butterfly and eventually they realize that the monarchs actually migrate to a pretty small, excuse me, area of Mexico up in the mountains. Uh, they would have never been able to find that out without citizen scientists. So citizen science is really important to the field of, fields of science. So uh, Homewood Science Center wants you to get involved in a citizen science project. Uh, it's called Celebrate Urban Birds and it's um, from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And the science question that scientists there are looking at is how do these 16 birds use urban spaces and uh, what is the value of green spaces for birds in urban areas? So scientists know that these particular birds, these 16 species are uh, often found in urban and suburban areas, but they're not sure how those birds are adapting as we um, develop more urban and suburban areas and green spaces are not found as easily as they used to be. 
So Celebrate Urban Birds Project has partnered with over 12,000 community organizations like Homewood Science Center over the years. Um, and uh, in doing so, you can um, inform scientists as well as your community about what we can do to support birds uh, in the area. Um, so just, I just wanted to um, go over briefly what um, is involved with So by doing citizen science, you are um, uh, doing, uh, being involved in the processes of science. And one of those skills is to make observations. So the first thing you would do is choose an area that's about 50 feet by 50 feet. It can be anywhere, it can be near your school, it can be a park, it can be your yard. Uh, and you're just observing for 10 minutes and you're looking for those specific 16 specific birds to see uh, if you see them or not. And if you don't see them, that's also important data. So letting scientists know you did not see the birds is uh, also good for the scientists to know. And you do these observations three times within a couple of weeks. Um, you also, uh, this project also supports the idea of asking questions. Uh, so within the project, there are a lot of educational resources um, that you have access to that gives information about each of these 16 species. So things including uh, habitats and the different structures they have, the different behaviors they have. So you can really take a deep dive into learning more about these 16 birds. And it's great because they're birds that we often see or they're common for us here in the suburbs. So the project itself um, has ta a tally sheet that you will have access to uh, and it allows um, you to conduct an uh, investigation. So you can choose a location you can decide how you're going to collect the data in groups or in pairs and how you should um, record the numbers that you see, for example. So it gives you some um, ideas for how to, um, to uh, structure an investigation and then to actually be involved in doing that investigation. And then the important part is that you're collecting and, and data every time you see some of these birds and you submit that data on the uh, Celebrate Urban Birds uh, website. Uh, and then the, the scientists are able to analyze that data, but you have a chance to analyze data too, because the website itself gives you access to other sites that have um, collected data. So you can compare the birds that you have seen, the data you get with other uh, uh, sites in the area. A lot of schools are involved in this. You can see what schools have discovered. And you can also um, pull up uh, species maps about populations of birds and where they've been found. So for example, on this screen, there's the European starling there. And you can see uh, the data as far as where this bird has been found in the United States. Then you get the opportunity to share your data with scientists, like I mentioned at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, but then also you can share it with your community. Uh, and uh, it's a way to connect to the community and communicate information, talk to others about what they found. And then in doing so, you're um, supporting uh, community science literacy, which what that means is it's the capacity of a community to um, do science and to use the science that they've learned to advance community priorities. So for example, we're fortunate enough to have Isaac Walton Preserve right next door to us. So knowing some more about the birds in the area and what we can do to support those birds is very important. Um, so our pop-up science, um, Holly mentioned, our pop-up science at home, family activities, um, will be uh, themed in the next several months for different aspects of the bir of birds. The first one is going to be about uh, diversity, bird diversity, so many birds. Uh, and so this pop-up science activity will be about how are birds different and how are they the same? So what makes a bird a bird? And so um, we will have activities for young children, um, for the K through two or preschool through two, and then three to five, and then some suggestions for middle school as well for activities that they can all do, you can all do around what makes a bird a bird. And then there'll be um, materials for creating a new species. So now that you've learned a lot about birds, 
how can you build, what would you do to build your own bird? What are the parts that you need to have for your bird? What color might you make it? And what are things you would need to think about for how the bird could protect itself from predators, for example? And then there'll also be a section on um, exploring birds through time. So it's very interesting to look at the fossil record of birds and to see how they evolved to what they are today. So I want you to um, keep watching for those. And like I mentioned, um, the resource that Holly mentioned, there are family activities too for you to explore and learning more about birds so we can um, increase our community literacy here in the home with Bosphor area. So thanks very much for, for listening and um, uh, uh, enjoy Ryan's presentation next. Thank you, Patty. That was wonderful. Um, we're very excited about the pop-up science at home um, activities. And I dropped a link in the chat for you to be able to sign up for pop-up science at home. The next pickup date, I believe is October 24th. Um, Ryan's just pulling up his slides now. And Ryan, don't forget to turn on your camera and unmute yourself. And Patty, thank you so much for sharing those wonderful resources too. Um, I know in the handout section, people were having a hard time accessing the agenda for tonight. I apologize. I did drop the agenda into the chat. So you can grab it from the chat and it has all sorts of wonderful, helpful links, especially to um, the educator guide, the flyer with all of our upcoming events and everything. Okay, Ryan, we see your slides up. So I believe you are here to uh, tell us all about our bird of the month and your work at University of Chicago. Take it away, Ryan. Yeah, thank you all for being here and thanks for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about my work and to talk about the barn owl. And I hope you do get involved in, in a lot of the things going on at Homewood Science Center. That's all really exciting and things that I've been able to partake in myself over the last couple of years. So um, I hope you get out there and have a lot of fun. But <clears throat> as Holly mentioned, um, I'm Ryan Fuller. I'm a PhD student or PhD candidate at the University of Chicago now. Um, I, you may notice in the intro that I don't actually work on birds, but um, Part of what I've come to do as my hobby is to to work with um, uh, you know going out into the parks in Chicago and and observe the birds. But in my professional life, I'm I'm a, training to be a scientist, um, and I've been able to go to been lucky enough to go to China. Um, my advisor works at the Field Museum, so I spend most of my time at the Field Museum, not actually in classrooms at the University of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> but I collect plants from the mountains of China, and really I'm just trying to get out why species look different on different mountain ranges. So you can kind of see some pictures here on, on my PowerPoint of, of the rhododendrons. Uh, you might better know them as azaleas is their common kind of common name, but um, I study the genus rhododendron and I, I look at their genetics, so their DNA, to tell how the species are uh, differ from each other. And I study them in the herbarium, um, as I mentioned at the, at the Field Museum. So. You've probably been to the Field Museum. I'm repping a Sioux t-shirt tonight, but uh, I grew up in Colorado. Um, and as a young kid, I was always going out outside and exploring, um, you know, where I grew up was one of the most popular places for dinosaur bones um, in, in the United States. And um, so I was always doing fossil digs and my parents would take me out to do, or I was collecting spiders from around the house. So I was just doing kind of fun things, but um, you know, never really participating in any citizen science. So it's exciting that a lot of those projects are up and coming. So I would have loved to do that as a kid. Um, but that's kind of the way that I got interested. And I've always been <clears throat> really attracted to, or drawn towards animals in particular. Um, it wasn't until I got to graduate school that I really started studying plants and doing those types of things. But, um, you know, I've, I've had kind of a long pathway to graduate school where I, I was a zookeeper, as Holly mentioned. So I worked as a conservation biologist with really rare and um, some extinct in the wilds, amphibians, so toads and frogs and salamanders. Um, I worked with them from all around the world trying to get their, their population boosted by starting breeding programs and captivity and, and really working with the zoo to try to boost those populations and make sure that we had individuals that could someday be released back to the wild. Um, and then from there, I kind of I moved on and decided I wanted to, to go back to school and, and that's how I've kind of come to go through my master's and now I'm working in my PhD. So 
I really do love doing the science, but I also love getting the opportunity to talk about the things that I enjoy and the observations that I've made and the things that, that I like to do. So if you have any questions about that, I would, I'd love to answer that, but I'm gonna move on to um, the star of the night really is, are the barn owls. Um, <clears throat> and as a, I guess I would call myself a young birder because I've only been birding since about 2016, but I've, I've been really lucky to get re really close to some like the world's best ornithologists at the Field Museum. So if you don't know, the Field Museum has one of the largest collections of birds in the world. Um, I think they're in the top three of, uh, in terms of numbers of species and numbers of individuals. Um, so it, it really, um, pulls a lot of uh, training ornithologists and scientists to come work on birds. And I've been lucky enough to go birding or bird watching with um, uh, gra other graduate students and scientists at the museum. So I've learned a lot. I've really been a sponge and it's, it's kind of become my morning, sometimes evening hobbies. Uh, like right here at MSI, I, I live, you know, just a couple of football fields away from the entryway to MSI and Hyde Park. So I spend a lot of time in Jackson Park birding. Um, I do have to make one kind of uh, embarrassing uh, confession is that I've actually never seen a barn owl in the wild. Um, and <laughs> maybe through some of these, uh, you know, these facts that I'm going to tell you about the barn owl, I've had to learn a lot about the barn owl and just in the last couple of weeks trying to get prepared for this presentation. Um, but some of the facts I'm going to tell you about them will tell you exactly why, you know, they're not seen as much. Um, but so yeah, our, you know, they're aptly named barn owl. Um, this picture is kind of, it's kind of great, but you kind of have a male and a female sitting there together. Um, they do roost and, and build nests and barns. So that's kind of where they've, they've gotten their names from. Um, but they, they do a lot of their activity at night. And during the day, they, they just roost in trees and they try to stay as still as possible. And they're, they're really, really hard to find. Um, I've even found some checklists from the Chicago land area where people get really excited. The birders in particular, if you don't know, Chicago kind of has a, a really um, a really strong uh, birder population. Like people go nuts for birds here in Chicago. And we are one of the biggest migratory corridors uh, for the continent because of the lake. So a lot of things get funneled through the parks and forest preserves. So, um, but, and one of those is sometimes the barn owl, they like to move through the Chicagoland area, but you know, something about barn owls is that they're easily recognizable. They have this heart-shaped face, um, you know, their overall plumage is white. So if you're ever driving down the road and you see like a bird with a four foot wingspan flash in front of your car, it's most likely a barn owl um, if it's white, because they, they, they don't look like any other North American uh, um, owl, which is really cool. Um, but like I said, they're extremely difficult to see because they usually don't start coming out and hunting until about maybe 30 or 45 minutes before sunset. So you have to be in the right place. And there, you would think that you could go to a forest preserve or something, but they're usually hunting over open spaces like agricultural fields or marshes or grasslands. So there's some grasslands near um, Homewood that would be a great, great candidate for looking for these birds. So now some really interesting facts about their anatomy is, you know, they they actually are almost soundless in flight. And there's there's some really cool videos on YouTube that you can go look up where scientists have tested different birds flying over high sensitivity microphones. And you, like even with the giant headphones that we're all getting used to using during this COVID era, you, they, you know, well-trained ears couldn't hear the flights as they go over them. So they use that as an adaptation to hunt at night and stalk their prey. Um, <clears throat> they also have these kind of actually humorously long legs. So if you ever look, sometimes there's memes or GIFs online of like where someone grabs an owl from the underside, like an owl in captivity and pushes them up <laughs> and their legs are super long. And so the owls are using these legs to shoot into crevices or through snow drifts or into dense vegetation with really, you know, sharp talons on the end to, to kind of spear their prey. Um, while they're hunting, so it's pretty cool. So I thought this was a pretty endearing picture, but it gives kind of a difference between adult males and adult females. So there is some plumage differences. Um, the, let's see if I can do this, laser pointer, okay. So the, this is the um, adult male on the left and he's a little bit smaller than the female. And the female has a little bit darker plumage here on the right, um, but their wingspan can get up to three and a half to four feet, so they, the really long wings um, and they use those for powerful flight and gliding through the air over their hunting grounds. 
So that kind of moves on to the next part of it, but our first poll question is, um, do barn owls hoot? So <laughs> the question is yes, no, or unsure. Ryan, I didn't know that we'd have an unsure option, so I just put yes or no, but... If you I mean, don't, you can put no. Okay, if you don't That's know, fine. you can put no. It's an interesting question because I think when so many people think of owls, the first thing you want to say, you know, like if you given the word owl and say one word back, you would say, whoo, right? Yeah, is, right? Isn't that what most people would respond? And a, and a lot of people are listening for that in their neighborhoods too, kind of the ooh, 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 you know. Um, and I think even in October, you know, like Halloween and stuff, there's a lot of folklore and kind of mystery between behind owls because they kind of have these some of them have creepy eyes and you know they're mysterious flying around at night and doing things like that so they've kind of getting gotten pulled into the halloween decor and all the lore surrounding halloween so it's kind of fun to get excited about bats and owls around this time of year you know yeah it looks like we have about 85 percent of our people um submitted their answers to our quick poll here so i'm going to go ahead and close this poll and Let's share the results. So 82% said no, they do not hoot to talk to one another. Ryan, tell us what, what the story is with the hooting. Can you still see my PowerPoint? Yeah, you're looking good. We're back on the PowerPoint. Okay. Let's see if it'll let me click here. Well, I should have an audio clip here. Oh, there it is. So the pe people who are right here said um, that they don't hoot. And and this is, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've come to find that uh, as my birding time and the owls that I have seen that don't include barn owls, I think I've seen about four or five owl species. There's only a couple of them that actually do the hooting sound that we've come to know and love so much. Um, I would probably say the barn owl is actually not that great of a sound to listen to. Um, it actually could probably be an audio track to some of our Halloween horror shows, but you're right that they don't hoot, so that's interesting. They, they do just kind of scream at each other, but that is the way. They also do these kind of endearing clicking noises. Um, that you can find. I dropped a link in at the end of this that will take you to a, a fantastic website for learning bird calls, but I'll get to that towards the end. Um, I want to talk a little bit about their range size too. So it is probably the most widespread owl species in the world. So I pulled this up from eBird, um, which is a, a citizen science thing from Cornell that um, Patty talked a little bit about, but these are all bird observations just for the barn owl across the world. Um, so there are 29 subspecies of this owl. Uh, there's a little bit of controversy on whether or not uh, those subspecies are not their own species, but as you can see, they, they have done really, really well, even getting out to like the Hawaiian Islands, the Galapagos, you know, a lot of the Polynesian Islands, um, Australia, Southeast Asia, and then in Europe and the United States, they're, they're probably the most studied owl by scientists just because um, we have such uh, easy access to them. We're zooming in a little bit closer to North America. You can see here's Illinois. Um, they, they're kind of like uh, seasonal migrants, but they won't really migrate to like South America or do anything that these long distance migrants are doing. Um, but we do have them uh, at all seasons in Illinois. They're just a little more uncommon, um, especially in the Chicago area because urbanization has really uh, depleted their habitat. And then I zoomed in even farther to kind of, you can see Homewood is here um, on, on the right. So you can see Homewood is here. And then I, I found some observations from the last five years for um, owls. And now I'm forgetting what the name of this grassland is, but uh, someone who lives in Homewood would probably be able to tell me. But there's a hot spot just, to, you know, just a few miles down the road on 80 there that you can, you can go. So any of these green spaces, even some of the open areas of Homewood, um, if you just keep your eyes looking, especially around dusk, you might find a barn owl flying by. Or if you're lucky, you'll find one roosting in a, in a pine tree or something like that. Okay, and a second poll question. What do barn owls eat? So this poll question, you can choose as many that you think are true. 
So barn owls eat, you can select from the following, mice, reptiles, grass, hay, bats. What do you think? We have about 70% of people have voted so far. I think that maybe everybody tuning in knows a thing or two about the barn owl. They might have been doing their research or Ryan, they might have even read your community journal entry before logging on tonight. I have, or we have barn owl experts in the crowd. Maybe we do have some barn owl experts. I know that some of our uh, conservation ecology interns, it looks like um, some of our past interns have tuned in tonight. So we know that there's, um, some young people in our community that really care about um, native plants and uh, beautiful bird species are here on the call tonight. So let's see what they said. Let's see the results. So 91% of our attendees think that they eat mice, 64% reptiles. I tried to fool you guys with the grass and the hay. I thought, hey, a barn owl, there's hay in the barn, um, but you guys were too smart for me. Um, and then 55% said that they eat bats. So Ryan, why don't you uh, shed some light on this? Well, happy to do that. Um, let's see. Okay, so for those of you who said mice, rats and mice, they really like voles, actually. Voles are just another type of rodents, but um, they specialize on almost anything that's small and, and a mammal. So, um, But they're also known to take bats out of the air because bats also hunt at night, so they have a lot of opportunity to, to take bats out of the air. But they're also known to prey on other like small songbirds, um, some reptiles, and some amphibians, and there's been a few... Uh, instances of them actually catching fish. Um, so there are fishing owls in the world. If you're interested in that, Google a great place to look at fishing owls. But onward with the barn owl, I just want to tell you a few more fun facts before wrapping up. But um, like I said, barn owls have been one of the highly, the most highly studied owl species in the world. Um, they do really well in captivity. So uh, their prey is, they, we've done a lot of um, really interesting sound studies uh, to see how they're detecting their prey and you know in complete darkness or under a full moon or something like that. Um, they have excellent night vision, so you can see their eyes are, are really big, really big pupils, but they also have excellent hearing. Um, so they can actually discriminate sounds um, of their prey, the, the differences between their different prey items. They might be able to tell a rabbit from a bull or a rat from a mouse, something like that, from their own vocalizations that the animals are making at night, which is really cool. And um, but I think one of the most interesting things about them is that their ears are actually what we call asymmetrical. So it'd be like if you took your left ear and moved it a little bit lower than your right ear and your left ear would be used to, you know, to listen to sounds that are coming above you and maybe on the middle plane. And then the right ear would be able to be more towards the ground. You can think about it almost as having like this binocular style sound. So they can, they really are excellent at pinpointing where sound is coming from. And then you might think that, oh yeah, the, the barn owl just looks pretty, that face is just for, for looks, but they actually be wrong. They actually have um, around this heart-shaped edge of their face, they actually kind of have more rigid feathers and all the feathers are funneling air and sound into their ears. Um, so they're constantly taking in the audio surroundings while they're hunting at night. Um, and so they've been shown to be able to uh, catch prey items in a completely dark room that scientists set up. So they, they would set up a room with the owl sitting in the middle of the room and then they would release the prey from some part of the room and the owl could pinpoint it in absolutely zero light. Um, so it's pretty spectacular. Um, and so they, they can capture prey hidden under deep vegetation or even under snow drifts in the winter time. So that's about all I have for you for the facts, um, but I did drop this too if you have access to the PowerPoint or if you wanna take a screenshot of this. Um, some of the things that I was using, the eBird has a really great um, species account website where you can look up any species that you want to. Um, if you wanted to know more about their hearing, I dropped a couple of YouTube videos um, with the websites there. And then Wikipedia has a really cool uh, a, um, article about sound localization and owls in general, not just barn owls. But 
And then a, a little lesser known resource is this website called Xenocanto. Um, and you can look up almost any bird species in the world and it will give you a, the complete library of their vocalizations that um, citizen scientists and scientists have deposited vocalizations that they recorded in the wild on this website. So if you wanna learn about screaming owls or hooting owls or anything like that, Xenocanto is your website. Um, and then I found another interesting, there's a lot of really cool citizen, or not citizen science, but um, just really cool, interesting articles about um, barn owl uh, behavior. So if you see the link here, it says barn owls reflect moonlight in order to stun their prey. Um, so there's some scientists in uh, the UK that are working on how barn owls can hunt in full moonlight and still be successful. So yeah, I, I encourage you to use eBird, iNaturalist, any of these things can be downloaded on your cell phone and just really get out there and learn about different life things that are going on around you. Um, so that's basically what I do if you don't, I use I use eBird on my cell phone and I use iNaturalist on my cell phone. So I'm constantly just snapping pictures of things on my walks and trying to figure out what they are um, from amphibians to spiders, to flies, to plants, to, to the birds, et cetera. Um, but if you don't have a cell phone, you can do it old school um, with scientists. You should just go out and write in a journal or draw in a journal if you if you have the you know the artistic prowess. Um, I encourage you to do that. So if you have any other questions, I would love to field things through my email or um, and I think we're taking some questions tonight. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. That was I learned a lot about the barn owl. Um, I thought it was interesting that the females are larger than the males. Um, why do you think that might be? So it, we also we find this a lot actually across um, a lot of different animal species where females have a little bit larger body mass to um, help with uh, the offspring. So like in, in the case of birds, right, it's laying eggs or things like that. They have a little more, more body mass to, to help with um, carrying the egg weight or to, to put more energy into egg laying or, or helping to raise the offspring versus the males. Beautiful. And then I know that um, we think that that population area of the barn owl that you found, um, that really that could be right along Volmer Road going from Flossmoor into Frankfurt area. So going back to what Patty mentioned about with um, creating your own um, count and participating in the Cornell lab, you could potentially choose a 10 foot area in there and maybe you might see the barn owls then and you could enter that data to Cornell and um, who knows, maybe Flossmoor is the next hot spot for the barn owl. That'd be great. Yeah, and one thing with owls too is like what I've learned from birders is that, you know, they, they go on owl prowls as they call them. And so owls do a lot of vocalizations in the middle of the night when we're all sleeping. So I've, I've been up at absurd times in the morning, like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning in December doing some of these Christmas bird counts, just listening for owls. So you're just freezing, sitting out in these agricultural fields in like southern, southwestern Wisconsin, <laughs> just listening for owls. So most of my eBird accounts of, of owls have actually not been visual, but auditory. So Wow, and that's got to feel so good then when you do see that owl, you know, when you're out there actually all bundled up, waking up before dawn and going out and seeing these animals. How does it feel when you actually spot an owl then? Yeah, you know, Seeing an owl in daylight has been one of the best experiences of a birder. We had a snow owl eruption a couple of years ago along the lakefront, so I had like 13 snowy owl observations. And then this spring, I just happened to find a great horned owl um, in one of the pine trees in Washington Park, on on in, in, uh, right here in Hyde Park, and I got amazing looks. So it's just it's really hard to describe that that feeling when you actually see one. The eyes are amazing, the face. They're big birds. They're just a lot of fun. They're, they're big birds. Okay, I don't see anybody with questions yet. Oh, um, I see that Amy Eagle is sharing that there is an owl prowl in Northbrook on November 15th. Um, she's given me a link here, so I'll drop that link in the chat. Amy, thank you. Uh, we nickname Amy Eagle is on our staff for Homewood Science Center and we nickname her Eagle Eyes. 
because she always finds wonderful stuff like that. So thank you, um, Miss Amy Eagle. You can find that in the chat for the Owl Prowl that's happening in Northbrook. Um, and that's wonderful. Um, citizen science is about getting out there in the community and connecting with other people through science. So um, this has been just a fabulous learning experience. I know I learned a lot. I'm very energized about um, the uh, citizen science projects that we're doing at Homewood Science Center. I'm going to go back and share my screen. I know we have some students here. Um, if you don't want to type in a question too, you can always raise your hand. We'll unmute you. Um, but I know that we have some students here that have tuned in specifically for their extra credit code. So you can let your teachers know the code for tonight is HSC OWL. That stands for Homewood Science Center OWL. Um, ask your teachers if you can get extra credit for participating and they will ask you for the code. You just give them the HSC OWL code. So folks, I wanted to take a minute um, and show you how easy it is to stay involved with our citizen science programming by highlighting some things on our website here. Um, so you can see we have all sorts of wonderful events. Next up, we have Saturday morning, our virtual family yoga. You can register by clicking here on the event and just grabbing the uh, registration link right there um, and signing up through the serendipity yoga uh, space. But Liz will be exploring observation with our youngest learners and we're gonna be doing that through movement. So how fun is that? Our next month of Spotlight On will also be on bird migration. And we have a wonderful friend that um, is also at University of Chicago joining us for that with our bird of the month. But before then, folks, don't forget about Walk Walton. It's a great way to get out and enjoy Homewood Isaac Walton Preserve. It's a socially distanced nature walk this year with a bio blitz. Um, Patty and um, Ryan, can you hop on and share your, your experiences with bio blitz? Can you turn your cameras and your mics back on and, and talk? Patty's actually leading the ecology internship and can tell us a little bit more about what to expect from the bio blitz. And then I know Ryan's participated in a bio blitz. So Patty, why don't you give us a little info about the bio blitz? Sure, we, we've been working hard with the middle school students who are very excited. Um, they're gonna be guiding the walks um, that we're gonna be taking you on. And we have different um, areas of Isaac Walton identified. We have wetland area, prairie area, and a woodland area. And Isaac Walton um, has never had a bio blitz before, a bio blitz um, involves people, citizen science uh, scientists in um, gathering data about what living things they see in these areas. So plants and animals that they see in the area. There'll be scientists there who will also be helping us out, helping us identify species. Um, I've never actually been in a bioblitz, so I'm very excited about that. Um, Ryan, what, what do you think of bioblitzes? Yeah, they're a lot of fun. I've been a part of a couple of them once during my master's degree in Colorado, where we did one in a high elevation mountain range with um, with students and members of the community. Yeah, it was a lot of fun just running around trying to <laughs> do what <laughs> we do all the time, trying to see what's going through there. Um, but it can be a lot of fun because yeah. it can change from day to day or month to month. With a lot of these yeah, things. It's, it's amazing when you really take a close look what you actually do see. You know, mm -hmm. when you walk by, you might not notice, but when you're trying to use your observation skills and really pay attention, it's amazing the diversity of, of plant life and also animals that you can find. Mm -hmm. Holly. Holly, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> There we go. Um, I do have a question coming in from a family at Homewood Science Center um, from Jesse. And they are asking, we built an owl house for the backyard. How likely is it that an owl will make it his home? Great question. And then I was muted. Um, that's awesome. I'm so happy that you've done that because um, that was one of the things I meant to mention in my in my PowerPoint, but uh, yeah, that's a great way to encourage owls to return 
back to this area because um, at once we did have I think a decent barn owl population around here because you know Illinois the whole Midwest is kind of this flat open space that they've specialized in and humans have kind of you know created agricultural land we use a lot of pesticides and rodent sides too so if you're using rodent sides at home I'd strong, strongly encourage you to reconsider using something else um, to control the mice around your house because that has killed off a lot of barn owls as well but to answer your question I I can't really give you like a positive you know like how how you know um, how likely it is that they will use it but I would encourage you to just upkeep the owl house um, try to keep in other invasive species out if you can um, and especially try to put some sort of predator anti-predator defense on because they'll they'll come they may you may have already had an owl visit that site and they deemed it not worthy or they started to build a nest and sometimes they'll just move on for no particular reason but i encourage you to just keep watching it and don't get too you know don't get too sad if they don't come because i think one day you'll be surprised you'll look out there and there'll be a little face poking out of the hole so. That's cool. Um, Jesse, would you mind if we unmute you and you can talk about, you know, maybe what inspired you guys to build the Owl House or how you went about doing this? Would you mind if I unmute you? I'm going to go ahead and unmute and see if they're they're willing to share. Jesse, are you there? You guys there? Okay, well, maybe not. Well, that's that's exciting though to hear that we have community members that um, are interested in, you know, repopulating the species throughout the, the south suburbs and in the Homewood Flossmoor area. So that's great. Um, and if you want to, you can always take some pictures of your owl house and post it in our community journal. Um, so going back just one more time, um, I just wanted to show you on the website how to access that community journal. Um, so if you're comfortable with that, we can say good night for now um, and you can head out. But I did want to take a moment just to show you all of the great features. Uh, we got stuck at events here and talking about Walk Walton, which is Sunday, October 18th. We're really excited about that. Patty, thank you for sharing more about Walk Walton in the Bio Blitz. Our bird of the month, you can find out more information about the barn owl um, by clicking its little file here and connecting into the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And then here's our bird of the month community journal. So you can see we have one young learner here, Claire, that shared um, a photo that she found online and an interesting fact that they eat their prey whole without chewing and then they spit out pellets. And then this entry here is from Ryan, um, who thank you so much for joining us tonight, Ryan. He gave us lots of wonderful written observation, even a link that you can check out um, science uh, observations on the eBird website here, and then a visual observation too. So we would love to see you out there, whether you're a student or an adult or a family, submit on our community journal entries. It's a great way to sharpen your observation skills, both with written observations and visual observations. You can do that simply by clicking the pencil here, and it's just a short online form. Um, you can fill it out, uh, leave your name or not, and then that'll filter right onto our website. And one of the cool things too is we're gonna be giving away cool Homewood Science Center swag. I think we've got some t-shirts, some water bottles, um, lots of cool stuff for participating in our community journal. So Patty, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We could not be more excited about citizen science and about, um, and about this program and um, and thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. We're super excited and we hope that everybody had a wonderful event with us and we hope that you'll join us again for our other upcoming Spotlight on presentations. So thanks you guys, good night. Good night. Good night, thank you.